A scandal is never good for any politician, but if one is to get involved in a scandal, it helps to be the key author of the legislation that created one of the most popular government programs. October 1974, sometime around 2 a.m. in the morning, D.C. Park Police pulled over a car driving erratically and without its headlights on. As they approached, a woman jumped out of the passenger side door and into the D.C. Tidal Basin. The driver, as it turned out, was Wilbur Mills, congressman from Arkansas and the congressional force behind Medicare. The woman, as it turned out, was an Argentine stripper named Fanny Fox. And this wasn't the only run-in for Mills. He was often inebriated at congressional hearings, although in those days, reporters kept some of those things out of the paper. Despite this scandal happening, just a month before Mills' re-election, 60% of his voters would send him back to Washington for another term. It was 1974, big year from Democrats. In fact, in the same state, a 25-year-old adjunct professor challenged a longtime Republican and almost won, gave him the run of his life. Bill Clinton didn't win, but Mills was returned to Congress. He wouldn't run again in 1976 and would, in fact, get treatment for his alcoholism. The idea of health care for the elderly was not new. Mills was not so sure about it in the beginning. He was a fiscal conservative. Since the late 1950s, the idea of health care for the elderly had been proposed. A bill called Care Mills, which also bore his name, covered some elderly through grant programs to the states. When President Kennedy ran for office, he asked for Medicare. And the Anderson-King bill was proposed in 1962. But due to opposition from conservative Southern Democrats, it went nowhere. With President Kennedy's death, Lyndon Johnson made elderly health care one of the big priorities of his administration, a piece of the Kennedy legacy that he was going to pass. The opponents, including the American Medical Association, the key association of doctors, and the Republican Party, and some businesses knew that they were on the ropes. Republicans proposed a financing program to pay for doctors' fees, insisting, as the American Medical Association insisted, that they would get their customary and usual fees. The doctors would be paid a price for their services that was adequate. Mills, as head of the Ways and Means Committee, the committee that spent the money in Congress, responded to the concerns of doctors by instituting a Medicare payment to the doctor that would represent a usual and customary fee. Medicare would also include a hospitalization program and an indigent program for those who could not afford health care. This part was handled by the states. To this day, Medicare has the legacy of Wilbur Mills, the fiscal conservative from Arkansas, and his conservative members of the Ways and Means Committee. Despite popular conception, Medicare is not completely free. There are premiums, but it is arguably cheaper than any private insurance ever could be, insuring such a large group of people who tend to have more health problems than the average population. So Medicare is not free, and Medicare is not financed by some business tax or corporate tax, but by payroll taxes on wage earners and on the self-employed. Even though doctors and small businesses bitterly opposed Medicare, their objections were addressed in the final product. When the proposal to create the President's Economic Security Plan, a plan we would now know as Social Security, was debated in Congress, an exchange we could imagine happening today almost, uh, occurred in the U.S. Congress. Senator Thomas Gore of Oklahoma, sometimes progressive, but often fiscal conservative, a Democrat from Oklahoma, from a different family from the former vice president, asked 
the chairwoman of the president's Economic Security Committee, Frances Perkins, the first woman to be a member of an American cabinet. Gore asked, is this socialism? No, Perkins said. Absolutely not. Then Gore asked, is this a teeny weeny bit of socialism? Maybe he was being a little cute with the first woman to be a cabinet member. But the question was not off base. And the answer was probably yes. It's hard to argue that what California fruit grower and Democratic Congressman Frank Buck would relabel social security instead of FDR's too boring name, economic security, a much better sell than the economic security, was indeed a teeny weeny bit of socialism. It does involve government payments from the young to the old, though with the provision that the old paid during their lifetimes. Indeed, the opposition from conservatives was strong. One senator from New Jersey said it would take the romance out of life. And Alf Landon, campaigning for the presidency in 1936, would say Social Security was a cruel hoax, a permanent reduction of salaries. Every worker, he said, just got a pay cut for the rest of their life. Conservatives and their objections, though, helped shape Social Security more than they might think. And they would provide opposition to the bill, but actually, they were not the significant opponent to FDR's passage of the legislation. It was the liberals, particularly Northeastern liberals in Congress, who thought the bill provided too little. And when the bill got to the Senate, Huey Long of Louisiana filibustered for 15 hours. Social Security, he felt, was puny compared to his Share the Wealth program, which would make every man a king, reduce their working hours, and provide for them. Today, Social Security is one of the most enduring government programs. Next to the post office, it is a government agency that we first think of, a guaranteed benefit. A word Roosevelt emphasized in his speeches about the program, guaranteed benefit, that a worker contributes to all his or her life and gets when he or she is over 65. But it has its roots in a very radical program proposed by an unemployed doctor in California, one that actually had more to do with jobs than providing pensions for the old. Dr. Francis Townsend moved to California because he had been unemployed as a doctor in the Midwest. Not able to find work, he got a government job. When a new party got into power, he lost that job, and he found himself 60 and unemployed, with only $100 in the bank. Along with a California realtor, Towns had started a group designed on a simple premise one that he felt could save America during the Depression. The biggest problem, Towns had felt, from his own experience and from what he saw around him, is that older people had nothing to do, and they had to be supported by their children. In many cases, people held on to jobs long past the age that they should have, because they had no other source of income. Give older people a pension, if they would pledge to leave their current job and spend the pension immediately within the United States. The whole program would be financed by a 2% tax on sales and on business transactions. So not just the final sales like a sales tax, but also a tax on every business transaction that occurred, the selling of the parts for the item before it's constructed. Sales tax on business transactions would fund the pensions. But taxing businesses would be okay, Townsend argued, because the program would put money in the hands of younger workers who would now have the jobs that the older workers gave up, and it would put money in the hands of old people who were required to spend it. The pensions he proposed were generous, $200 a month, a lot of money in that time. Depending how you calculate things, I mean, for instance, if you compare it to the cost of a car then versus a car now, 
That was like getting something like $4,000 a month. Towns and organizations blossomed in major cities. 1,200 clubs formed across the nation. The clubs gave older people who may have moved in with their children a reason to live, a reason to do something. People went to stores and tried to get merchants to sell them items on the promised pension as soon as the bill would pass. Townsend, Long, and a liberal preacher made, named Father Coughlin were the trio on the left that gave FDR as many headaches as did Southern Democrats and Republican conservatives on his right. But eventually, these Townsend clubs would do more than simply advocate for the pension bill. They would start endorsing candidates. In one primary in Michigan, they got a Republican to win what had been a safely Democratic congressional seat when he endorsed the Townsend program. Soon the organization got the entire California congressional delegation to support a bill resembling the Townsend plan in Congress. And they got a California congressman to sponsor it. This demonstration of political will, and not so much the nifty idea, was enough to convince Franklin Roosevelt and the Democrats to decide to make an old age pension part of his plan. After the 1934 midterms, he, the Democrats had a safe majority in Congress. Roosevelt enacted several pieces of legislation, and economic security would be one of them. However, Social Security that we know now and the one that passed in 1935 was not the Townsend plan, not exactly. It resembled the plan, but a key difference. The focus was more on the pensions and not so much on giving up jobs. Workers and employers would also pay for the program, not a tax on corporations or in business transactions or sales tax. The tax on workers and employers the payrolls of now to pay for the pensions of tomorrow was for two reasons. One is that it would be solid. Unlike the vague business transactions tax that many economists argued could not pay for the pensions that towns had wanted, with FDR's plan, the financing would be solid. That was a requirement of the Southern conservatives, uh, led by Pat Harrison in the Senate, Pat Harrison, senator from Mississippi, and Robert Doughton, of North Carolina, who convinced many of their Southern colleagues to go along. The program had to pay for itself. The second reason, as Roosevelt articulated, was to provide a stake for the worker. No one could later take it away because the worker had paid into it. Roosevelt's instincts have proven true. Social Security is known as an entitlement. It's very difficult to dislodge. When President George W. Bush attempted to change the Social Security to private accounts, he faced quite a bit of opposition in the attempt. According to Perkins, Roosevelt had once said to an economist who told him that the tax on payrolls was, not, uh, was regressive and would stop uh, workers from spending, he said, you may be right, it was never about economics. It was about politics. Roosevelt's plan, unlike Townsend, was also slow. Townsend's plan would work immediately. The pensions would go out, the money would have to be spent in that month, and the workers would give up, the old workers would give up their jobs immediately. FDR's plan was much slower. Taxes on payrolls collected in 1937 would not pay for pensions until 1942. Now, later, and partially with the backing of the Townsend organizations, which still remained in effect after the passage of Social Security, they did not consider their work done, the bill would be changed, and the first Social Security payments would start in 1940, two years earlier. Townsend died in 1960, having built an organization, having affected national policy, but never building the political organization that he wanted to build. His organization had had a few setbacks. There were some accounting problems. There was some embezzlement, and there was infighting. The Social Security we know today, widely viewed as the brainchild of Franklin Roosevelt or New Dealers, is actually a hodgepodge of a, an extreme 
radical idea, really designed to create jobs, Franklin Roosevelt's own tinkering, and, and that of his members of his administration, and the requirements of Southern conservatives needed to pass Social Security. Among the many things dropped was the requirement to spend the money that month. Also dropped was a proposal to include health insurance along with the old age funds, given that one of the biggest expenses for older people was health care. Both Social Security and Medicare were passed with large majorities in Congress, and both were passed with some Republican as well as majority Democrat votes. But in both cases, the last vote total does not reflect the amount of congressmen who supported the idea in the first place. Many had to be brought along. In the case of Social Security, Republicans voted for the disability and unemployment portions of the bill. Remember, Social Security covers not only the pensions for the elderly, but also unemployment and disability insurance. They voted for that portion, but tried up until the last vote to remove the pensions for the elderly from the bill. When that amendment failed, they, many of them then voted for the bill. In fact, in the House, 81 Republicans voted yes for Social Security. Social Security was passed in 1935 with the largest Democratic majority in modern times. Medicare was passed in 1965 when Lyndon Johnson wrote in again with one of the largest congressional majorities in modern times. Yet compromise still occurred, if not for votes, then to limit opposition to the long-term survival of the programs. Prior to Social Security and Medicare, the biggest federal issues were the tariff and the civil service. This makes sense. The tariff, the tax on import, determined how money was to be raised to fund the federal government. But the jobs funded by those receivables, starting with the jobs to collect them in the first place, were filled often with political patronage. The spoils, as Andrew Jackson's people called them. After the Civil War, it was not Jackson's Democrats, but the Republicans who controlled the federal government. But by the 1870s, people had tired of what they perceived as corruption. In 1878, President Hayes sought to eliminate the practice of appointing people by politics. Lacking congressional support, or even cabinet support for his idea, Hayes simply issued an executive order that the hiring of the federal government, officials of the federal government would have to be based on merit. He also used one of the few weapons available to a 19th century president. He devoted his 1877 annual message, this would be a written message, to civil service reform. Earnest and prompt action was required by the American people, Hayes urged. Those in his own party, the Republicans, didn't like the idea so much. Roscoe Conkling, powerful senator from New York, called it snivel service reform. Hayes would further anger Conkling when he fired the director of the New York Customs House, New Yorker Chet Arthur, a minion of Conkling who would become president in a few years and, oddly enough, play a role in the story of civil service reform. Then Hayes did something that doesn't conform with our notion of quiet 19th century presidents. He appointed two reform-minded people to the post and pushed Congress to confirm them. Congress, led by Conkling, stalled. But Hayes appointed them anyway. He made a recess appointment after waiting a few months. Then he forwarded a report to the Senate detailing the corrupt practices of the New York Custom House. Republicans would appoint the commissioners with the help of Hayes' Treasury Secretary, John Sherman, who was also for civil service reform, and the help of a key Democrat, David Key of Indiana. But although he was able to appoint reformers to the New York Customs House, Hayes would get no further with legislation on civil service reform. But in advocating civil service reform in 1878, Hayes was not only 
doing the right thing. He was a three-term governor of Ohio before becoming the Republican nominee for president and getting elected. Hayes was aware of the politics. Civil service reform was good politics. Appointing patronage at this point was bad politics. As Hayes said once, five friends are made cold or hostile for every new appointment. And no new friends are ever made by those that are appointed. There probably isn't a politician out there today that wouldn't sympathize with what Hayes said. But even though Hayes' motives were partially good politics, the Republicans wouldn't see it that way. Led by Conkling, Hayes would be denied the nomination. He would sacrifice his nomination for the cause of civil service reform. Garfield, a compromise candidate between the corrupt stalwart faction of the Republican Party and the less corrupt half-breed faction of the Republican Party, was elected to the presidency. Then Garfield disappointed stalwarts with his appointments, and while boarding a train, a man would shoot him. The man was a psychopath, and he had no real involvement in politics. But when he shot Garfield, he shouted, I am a stalwart, and now Arthur is president. And he kept referring to Arthur as his good friend. This was not good for the new president, Chester Arthur, the gentleman boss, symbol of New York patronage and minion, and a right-hand man of Roscoe Conkling. Reformers urged Arthur just to step down. He couldn't take over even though he was vice president and constitutionally should, he couldn't take over from Garfield, given that his assassin kept invoking Arthur's name. But Arthur refused. For the fourth time in history, the Republic, its chief magistrate, has been removed by death. Men may die, but the fabric of our institutions remain unshaken. Arthur retained Garfield's aides, those who were willing to stay, and appointed people who were not completely neutral in the squibble between the stalwarts and the half-breed Republicans, were not Roscoe Conkling's choices. And that was enough to infuriate Senator Conkling, who wanted 100% loyalty. But Arthur had already disappointed the boss of New York by taking the position of vice president at all. When Republicans nominating Garfield offered the vice presidency to a Conkling lieutenant, Conkling saw it as no more than a feigned courtesy to him, and he wanted none of it. He urged Arthur not to take it, and was actually upset when Arthur accepted the vice presidency. Now that he was president, Arthur supported a form of civil service reform, one based on the British system that some of the Republican reformers were supporting. It protected those who were already in offices from some political squabbles. The Democrats wanted more, and in the congressional elections of 1882, they found an issue. George Pendleton of Ohio advocated for a system of competitive examinations where federal office holders would be tested in order to qualify for the jobs, and a wandering examiner would reach posts far from Washington, D.C., to be sure that all federal employees were qualified. In the 1882 midterms, Democrats cleaned up. They were an absolute disaster for Arthur's party, the Republicans. And Arthur, now really infuriating Roscoe Conkling, advocated for civil service reform with examinations and supported the Democratic bill, the Pendleton bill. With a Congress and a President both agreeable, civil service reform bill passed. And it still bears the name of the senator from Ohio, the Pendleton Act. At the time of passage, only a fraction of people in the federal government employment were tested. Future presidents would add to this. Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson would increase the number. And by the 60s, and by the mid-20th century, 61% of those in federal employment were subject to civil service examinations. It's also present in many state and local jobs. It has not eliminated patronage, to be sure. It has not eliminated politics, but it probably has mitigated it some. 
and has insulated some people from the adverse effects of political change. Social Security, Medicare, and civil service reform represent major changes in federal government on the scale of the health care reforms proposed by the Democratic Congress and President Obama. And so they provide a useful comparison. Particularly the first two, Social Security and Medicare, have the image of being programs put in by a president, exactly the program that they proposed. But this is not true. A few things happened in each case. A president advocated for the more general goal. Lyndon Johnson wanted to see hospitalization coverage for seniors. He got a three-part bill, including doctor payments, hospitalization, and care for the indigent. In each case, a president and the ideas of the opposite party or faction were included into the surviving plan. The plan disappointed those who had initially advocated. None of these plans included everything that the initial supporters wanted. With Medicare, it was the idea of financing doctor payments. With Social Security, it was a tax on payroll rather than on corporations or business transactions. With civil service reform, it was the inclusion of examinations and the number of positions that were tested, far less than what some supporters would like. Looking at these three major changes, incredible passages, as I call them, in federal policy, gives you some idea of what could happen in the health care debate. Maybe the ideas of the opposition will be included in the plan that passes. I note with Social Security and with Medicare that in some cases these changes occurred not just to get the votes of the opposition, because in some cases those votes were not available, but just to limit opposition to the plan so it might be sheltered from a future Congress. Passages of major federal legislation, for all the talk about how much Congress can do, Congress tends to be moderate in its approach. Major changes in federal policy don't occur that often, and when they do occur, they're gradual, and they're a hybrid of many ideas. Let us not forget that the very Constitution that creates the federal government that exists today was a hybrid program. A strong central government mixed with some powers delegated to states and with a bill of rights protecting individual liberty from the very government they were creating. Hybrid idea, which is then built on over time. When Social Security was first developed, there were not the automatic cost of living adjustments that we see today. That was created by Wilbur Mills in the 1970s. We don't know what will happen with health care legislation. It's certainly run into some bumps, and there's certainly a lot of partisan activity on both sides. President Obama's strategy in this situation contains some observation of the history. It could just be the recent history of the failure of the Clinton health care plan. Or it could be a broader view. President Obama has stayed away from a specific plan, though he has advocated for certain goals, including a public option. But he stayed away from certain plans. He's allowed key members of Congress to introduce legislation for him. The Baucus bill, for instance, led by one of the more conservative Democrats, Max Baucus of Montana, head of the Senate Finance Committee, was revealed recently. No one seemed happy with it, certainly not Republicans who oppose health care reform at this time, and not a liberal Democrats who didn't think the plan went far enough. The Baucus bill is probably dead on arrival although it has the backing of one group, the healthcare industry. But President Obama's name is not attached to that bill. It's the Baucus bill. So if it fails, it's a failure of the Senate. Obama has kept himself open to continue to negotiate on the issue, all the while advocating for the general goal of providing health care for the uninsured and reducing costs. Some of the major issues of the opposition including malpractice reform, including limits on the cost of the plan, may have to be incorporated in the final legislation. And in no way should this be considered mere bipartisanship. 
Indeed, Medicare and Social Security were plans created by Democrats and uh, voted on by Democrats would probably not have been implemented during a Republican administration. So it's not about meeting in the middle on everything. It's about limiting opposition, both at the current time as the bill passes Congress and for future. With any change in federal policy, it's possible that a Congress down the road could reverse it, unless the plan gets established and is extremely popular with people. That has to be considered in any plan. If it's something that's, that there's such hostile opposition to, it might be reversed shortly. Social Security in particular was designed to survive the times. I want to thank you for listening. The website's myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. We're on Facebook, and uh, want to mention the archives available on $9.99. You'll get uh, most of the podcasts that we've recorded since 2006, all types of topics, uh, Brown versus the Board of Education, the Federal Reserve, the Second Amendment, the Speaker of the House, midterms, primaries, conventions, France in America, Britain in America, all sorts of topics are available at the archive site. My history can beat up your politics.com. <music>